God wants to do with mixed up, messed up, insignificant vessels. Vessels that seem to be meaningless, have no place. Because can I tell you something? There are certain things that we have done that now all of a sudden society says you have no place. You don't fit here anymore. And sadly, the church says you have no place. They told me you can come in and we'll let you be saved. But you got to sit on the pew and act like you're supposed to act. Don't you say anything and don't you sing because, you know, you know, you're a prostitute. You know what you did. Well, thank you very much. I know exactly what I did. But I ain't doing it anymore. But see, I understand authority. And I understand submission. So I submitted. I sat on the pew for eight years and I did nothing because I saw myself as insignificant. I couldn't get over what I had done. You'll never be a wife. Look at you. How in the world could you be a wife or a mother? Because you're trash. Was what they told me. And I heard God speak to me one day, and he spoke one word. Treasure. He's a recycler. He's good at it. He can take old messed up trash, and he can make it his treasure. But will you let him? Will you let him? I don't care what the church says. I don't care what society says. I don't care what your family says. I understand when your family gives up and said, you know, we've tried for you long enough. We've, we've tried long enough. I understand that. I totally understand that. And sometimes you have to prove your way. Sometimes it takes a while for them to see, guess what, she's going to stand this time. Because I didn't go back to church just one time and get saved. It took a bunch of times for me. I do pretty good for a few days. But, you know, then you start getting into that well, it gets Friday. No, it gets Thursday. Well, usually we start on Wednesday. But anyway, I can make it till about Wednesday. If you don't start drinking till Friday, you ain't got a problem. You good. We started on Wednesday, all right? You start gearing up. I understand the issues. But I know what it feels like to be totally free and free indeed. Ten years clean. Ten years. Ten years. I have a 15, 16, he's almost 16 here, baby. 16 year old son. And a cowboy. Anyway, we won't talk about the cowboy right now. But God will send you a cowboy. Boys, he won't send y'all a cowboy. If he does rebuke it, he'll get you a cowgirl, but not a cowboy, all right? I'm just saying, all right? The title of my message this morning, and I, I really I did not want to preach this because it's not normally, it's not like something that I would preach. It's just a little bit different, but I, I'm just going to have to follow the Lord because I, it's, it's, I just got to. The title of my message is Insignificantly Significant. Insignificantly Significant. Have you ever thought about the things in your life that you thought were insignificant? They didn't matter. At the time, they, weren't in, they were insignificant. But later you realize that was a significant moment. Later you realize it was extremely significant. I didn't think much of it. I just passed it off. Oh yeah, whatever. But later you realized it was very significant. Significant, not insignificant, but significant means this. It means significantly great. It didn't look like it was a great thing at the time. Hmm, but I missed it. It means, watch this, important enough to be worthy of your attention. Significance. There was a time when, when God was not significant to me. When you wake up in the morning and you rush out the door, you are saying you are not worthy of my attention. I just preached. When everything else comes in the way, 
when I, when I go to the bank before I pray, when I get married before I pray, when I make a decision before I pray, when I cuss somebody out before I pray, if you'd have prayed, you might wouldn't have cussed them out. Or maybe you would have used at least a few less words. <laughs> But it wasn't, this was not worthy of my attention. Something else was more worthy of my attention. Because at the moment, the thing that was seeking your attention was a small thing and you missed the moment. Can I tell you the thing that is seeking your attention is not a thing, it's a him. <laughs> He said, I came to seek. You thought you were searching for God. But can I tell you, God has been searching for you. He will search for you in the most unlikely places. You can't go deep enough, bad enough, get drunk enough, get high enough. You cannot be mean enough. You cannot get in a prison big enough and tight enough that God will not continually seek for you. You cannot mess up enough many times that he says, I'm finished with you. No, he created you in his image and he is seeking for that image and he is bound to that image to complete what he started. And even when we call him insignificant, he calls us significant. Significant. As your children begin to grow up, and especially with our son as a mom and as a dad as well, you look back and you say, wow, what I thought was an insignificant moment sure does mean a whole lot more now than it did then. I called mom and I said, Mom, you gotta come get this child. He is possessed. All four year olds are possessed. They can't help it, they're just possessed. Amen. And mom would say, Baby, one day you're gonna miss that battle. One day you're gonna miss that arguing. One day you're gonna miss that argument. One day you're gonna miss that crying. One day you're gonna miss it. You don't realize that it is significant. You don't understand it. When Sterling walks in the door now, almost 16 years old, I can look back on so many things that I think, Lord, I wish other things had not been so important. Because I missed the significant because I called it insignificant. There are gifts talents, callings in you that you miss because you call it insignificant. And God said, I gave it to you for a significance. Oh, it may not make you famous. may not put you on TV. It may not even draw the light. But it's significant. It's significant. It matters. Marriages crumble because of the inability to determine significant moments. We, we have all kind of reasons for marriages crumbling. We say that marriages crumble because he ran around on me and she ran around me and he did this and she did that. Really, the marriage started crumbling when you started missing the moments. When it was important to her, but it wasn't important to you. When it was important to him, but it wasn't important to you. My husband comes home from work He's a safety man. He's retired 22 years from the Air Force. And he's a safety man now. Works for Georgia Power for a power company. Whatever it does. I don't even know what he does. But he talks to me about it all the time. <laughs> he comes in and he wants to tell me what happened on the, on the job that day. He wants to tell me all about it. Well, it is not significant to me. I've been dealing with a 15-year-old. I'm trying to get a message. I'm trying to deal with these heathens. I mean, these lovely people at the sanctuary. I'm, and I'm trying to get ready for a conference coming up. And I've got a TV station calling me. And yet, it's calling me wanting bobbles. And somebody else is wanting me to sign a contract. And, and I'm going all over the place. But he wants to tell me about the dude that fell, you know, 500 feet off of a ladder and broke his neck or something. And it's not significant to me. But I learned something real quick. It is to him. So I sit down and I have to, I mean, I listen <laughs> because it matters to him. He is not interested at all in my bad hair day. He couldn't care less. 
But he always says, how's your hair today, honey? <laughs> He's a good man, yeah. Because he knows it's significant to me. We have to learn that sometimes God wants to sit us down and he wants to talk to us about something. That it doesn't seem significant to us, but God, this has nothing to do with my purpose and it has nothing to do with what I'm doing right now. But maybe it has something to do with what he wants you to do tomorrow. But it's not significant to us. So God, if you're not talking to me the way I need to hear it, if it's not grandiose, if it's not thunder or lightning and smoke, I don't need to hear it right now. And we miss moments. We give up on God because of the inability to determine the significance of what he's doing in this season. If you miss this season, the significance of this season, you're going to fail in the next season. Your crop is not going to produce what it could produce because you miss this season. You cannot skip winter. Winter is necessary. Okay? Although I would like to skip it. Of course, I like winter but because I, I like cold seasons. But sometimes it gets really bad. It gets really rough. Can I tell you a little something? Lamaze classes? Anybody, anybody ever had a, a baby? Any women ever had a baby? Any husbands ever been through it with them? You know, Lamaze classes seem to be so incredibly insignificant. What do you mean? She's pregnant. We're going to have this baby. Why well, we got to go learn how to breathe? <laughs> Can I tell you why? Because if you don't go to those classes and you don't learn how to breathe, when the pain comes, you're going to forget what you need to do and all you're going to do is scream. But if I go to the classes through the whole nine months and my husband goes with me to the classes, when the pain starts to hit, we know exactly what to do. And now all I got to do is breathe. Why is it so important to breathe? Do me a favor. Take in a breath. You just took in the presence of God. <clears throat> so if I scream during my dilemma and I don't breathe during my dilemma, then I'm trying to conquer my dilemma without the significance of God. Because if I take him in, he's got to come out. So if I breathe him in during my dilemma, then I have the ability to just breathe and the dilemma has to cease. But we miss the significant moment. Y'all look here, you go home. It takes pain to birth something, but it's worth it. I don't know, they tell me about it. Thank God he let me adopt because I'm not so sure I'd have made it through it. Me and Dwayne would have killed each other for sure. <laughs> There's a, there, you know, there's a, there's a, a good thing in adopting. You don't have to go through the birth, all right? But I've learned something with this walk with Jesus, with this walk with God. Anything that I do is going to take a process of birthing. And once I birth one, he puts me through another one. It goes from one process to the other. Have you ever gotten over one battle and said, oh, Lord, here we go. If you don't get through the, the first one, if the first one is insignificant to you, then you're not strong enough to handle the second one. That's why as the battles keep coming, we get weaker and weaker and weaker and we give up. Can I tell you, be careful what you place above seemingly insignificant things, people, trials, struggles, and places and times. Because God has a way of using insignificant things things and insignificant people and insignificant moments for his purpose. We talked about your purpose last night, didn't we? Well, tonight we're going to talk about, or this morning we're going to talk about God. Here's the thing. You can't go back and get the missed moments. Once we miss it, it's gone. If I spent 10 years of my life drunk and high. I can't get those years back. It's gone. I missed it. But I'm going to tell you something. I got good news. Hang on. Don't get depressed. Not yet. COVID going to go somewhere. I found a secret in the Word of God. Your life is in that Bible that you tote. 
Your lifeline is in that Bible, okay? I found the secret in the Word of God. This is what I found out. My God, your God, is a God who redeems time. He is a master of going back that He might bring you forward so that the insignificant moments can be regained and not lost so that you can reach your purpose. Turn to Joel 2. We're going to go there and then we're going to go somewhere else. I know it's Palm Sunday. Y'all all right? Have I got a few minutes? Amen. All right, let me know when I run out of time. I tell y'all that if y'all don't let me know. I'm watching Wendy and she just keeps telling me to keep preaching. She's the one with the camera. <laughs> I'm going to keep preaching. Joel 2. Now, normally I tell y'all what is before and after, but I can't. So you're going to have to go to the front of the book and look it up. It's in the Old Testament. All right, because when it gets past Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Genesis, H, Leviticus, Numbers, I'm lost. <laughs> but it's in there. I promise you. Somewhere at the back of the Old Testament, I know that. Isn't it? Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's why you surround yourself with people who are gifted in areas that you are not. Amen. Okay? That's what you do. My church helps me quite often because, they, you know, yeah. Joel 22, I mean, excuse me, Joel 2 and, and 25 says, And I will restore the years. I will restore the years. What does restore mean? In the Hebrew, I needed to know. What does it mean? It means complete. Complete. It means make over. You're going to get a do over. I will restore the years. Make over. It says to reckon. Paul said, I reckon myself to be dead to sin that I might live in Christ Jesus. It means to reckon. I don't see the restoration yet. Right now, I'm still in this program. Right now, I'm still fighting the urges. We talked about urges last night. Y'all need to get that CD. If you didn't get it, you need to buy it. It'll, it'll, it'll bless you, I'm telling you. We talked about the urges. I'm still in the middle of these urges right now, but I reckon myself to be free of this urge because I am sick and tired of being sick and tired, and God told me that he would restore, he would reckon the years unto me. So I reckon myself to agree with his word because his word is greater than my thoughts. His word is greater than my feelings. His word is greater than my past. His word is greater than my future. His word is greater than my desires. His word is greater than my need. Are y'all hearing what I'm trying to say to you? My Lord. I want to look at me in that tone of voice. If I can dance on the bar, I can dance up here. Lord, have mercy. Means to reckon. Watch this. This is good. Joel 2 and 25 says, To reckon. Watch this. This is good. It means to bring into submission to God. Uh huh. He said, I'll take your past that was tainted and insignificant. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use your past and I'm going to bring it under subjection to me. That's a good God. Because sometimes I'm having a problem with bringing my past under subjection because it keeps chasing me and it keeps running after me. And every time I walk in mall Walmart, they say there goes the preaching prostitute. But I have to turn around and look at them and say, but God brought that under subjection. I don't have to pay for that anymore. That don't have anything to do with me anymore. God brought it under subjection. All the pain, all the abuse, God brought it under subjection. That's why I'm not tripping over the fact that I was molested when I was five. I ain't tripping over that anymore. I'm tired of tripping. I'm just saying. Time for us to stop tripping, alright? Oh Lord have mercy. Watch this. Man can replace your money. Better yet, you can replace your money if you get out and get a job. <laughs> I tell people this everywhere I go, but I wanted a Mercedes Benz. I started claiming a Mercedes Benz. I took my husband to the lot and showed him the Mercedes Benz, and he looked at me and said, claim them payments. <laughs> can I tell you, we are still not driving a Mercedes Benz. 
I cured that right there. Man can replace your stuff. Man can replace your lost jobs, lost power, lost positions. As a matter of fact, we can fix our marriages and our relationships, but only God can reach back into your past and reckon it to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and take everything that you lost in your past and multiply it and bring it under subjection to him and use it to buoy you and to your future. I don't excite the pudding out of y'all. Jesus have mercy. Only God can restore time and lost years. And he does it by bringing it under subjection to his authority. What is his authority? His word. If you do not believe his word over their word, his hands are tied. Because your past is going to keep shouting at you. Everybody's got a past. You don't have to have just been a drug addict. There's some religious people sitting on the church pew that you've never drank a drop. You've never smoked a thing. You've never shot up. And you've never slept with anybody for heavenly days. So you barely sleep with your husband. That's why your marriage is falling apart. But anyway, you... <laughs> my husband just went, no, she didn't. <laughs> but you don't have to do all those things to need God to reach back and fix something. Because sometimes the holy folk need to be fixed worse than us drug addicts need to be fixed. Because we know what we're doing. Sometimes y'all was the reason we was where we was to start with. Alright? I'm just saying. I love you, but it's the truth, Pastor. My Lord have mercy. <laughs> Never in my life been judged. So that's why we got drunk. They didn't judge us. We fell down. They picked us up. Come on, have another shot. I mean, you come to church, you fall, and they kick you down. But not here. Not here. That's why I love y'all. That's why I like grafted in here, all right? Somebody needs to look at your neighbor and say, we're going back this morning. Joel said, or the Lord said in Joel, he said, I will restore the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm. Watch this. Catch it. God's talking, right? I'll restore the years that the locust has eaten. And not only the locust, but the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. My great army, which I sent among you. I want you to look there. Am I, am I seeing things or did that say that God said it was his army that came against you? Did God say that it was his army that was the locust and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the pommel worm? Did he say he's the one sent it against us? Ain't that what it said? I know I ain't reading things. I saw it. All right. My Lord have mercy. It said that all of this were his, was his great army and he sent it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Why? What he did was he brought these things under his authority. So you thought it touched you to break you, but it was under his authority. So it actually touched you to make you, not to break you. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Because my God is never out of control. Amen. He is always in control. How dare we say that he didn't have control? He always has control. So even though we made wrong choices, he still took the wrong choices that we make and he still took it in his hand and he said, I ain't going to let it go, but so far. He said, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it and I'm going to use it for my glory. You didn't understand that it was being used for your glory, but God said, I made it my great army. He said, I didn't turn it loose to save and let Satan do anything he wanted to do to you. I already have authority over Satan. I already took the keys from him. He has no authority over you. He said, I just let it touch you for a season. Can I tell you, God is the commander of the army. Good and bad. Does that make sense to y'all? My Lord, have mercy. Everything that has ever entered your life has had a purpose. 
everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly, has had a purpose, okay? And it was a purpose, it was a purpose to get you to your purpose. Nothing escapes God. Now I do want to make one thing clear. God is not a bad God. All right? He did not cause something bad to happen to you. I've heard people say, well, God took my daddy so I'd serve the Lord. No, if you can't serve the Lord because you love Jesus, taking your daddy ain't going to do a bit of good. Okay, so I don't, I don't believe that. God is not. God is good. And in him there is no evil. In him there is nothing bad. His nature is good. People ask me all the time, how do I know if this is God or not? Line it up with his nature. You can't line it up with his nature if you don't know his word because his nature is in his word. The Bible said that he is good and that he is good all the time and that he created you for good and that he called you to good and that he placed a purpose inside of you. Now why in the world would a loving God send something to destroy you? That is not God, okay? God is not the creator of the things that, that we see as destruction, okay? We made a choice and he took control. Okay? Instead of the enemy just being let loose, because I'm going to tell you, I have felt like he'd been let loose in myself, in my house before, in my life before. And I loved it when I got in the Word and said, Wow, God, you had control even then. That's why when I tried to kill myself, I couldn't. That's why I couldn't OD. That's why I couldn't run off the road with my drunk self. That's why I got put in jail <laughs> with my drunk self. <laughs> Because God was in control, all right? Can I tell you something? Some of the things that you lost during these years, and even, I'm not talking about just when we're not serving God. I'm talking about some of the things that we lose, period, we needed to lose. Okay? We needed to. There was a purpose. We don't understand it at the moment, but there was a purpose. But some of the things that you've lost, I'm about to tell you something. God's about to restore. God told me at 5 o'clock this morning, some of the things that you lost, he's about to restore. If you will reckon him to be in control of your situation. If you will reckon his word. If you will give his word significance. If you will find him worthy. God says some of the things that you lost, I'm about to restore. My Lord, have mercy. Can I tell you a secret? You're not going to have to fight to get it back. God said, I'm going to restore it for you. I'm going to restore it for you. You know how? Because God's going to be the one to go back. Because you can't. God said, I'm going to reach back in time. I'm going to snatch something that snatched you. And I'm going to bring it into your now so that you can use it in your future. Is that good? That's a good word. He said, and you're going to eat plenty. That's a good word. And you shall eat plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of your Lord. He said, the, you'll praise the name of your Lord God that has dealt wondrously with you. Hear me. And my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. In the mouth of two or three is a thing established. God just said, and my people shall never be ashamed twice. In the mouth of two or three is a thing established. Here's the problem. We live under the shame of yesterday. When God is trying to tell us, and my people shall never be ashamed. We keep living in the shame of the things that we've done that we can't undone. The things that we did that we can't undid. Okay? So we live in the shame of it. I'm, I, actually, I'm quite amazed to see the people in the body of Christ that literally live in shame. When God said, I am not the author of shame. I know he said confusion. But he said, I did not place shame on you. That's right. He said, I, didn't, I, I never would let anybody say to my son, shame on you. That's right. I, just, I didn't receive that. I didn't like it at all. All right? God has a purpose for you. And can I tell you, shame is not a part of it. Okay, you can hold your head high. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care who you did it with. And you can walk in the face of the one you did it with and hold your head high. Okay? Y'all good? It said this. God said that he wanted us to be satisfied and free from shame. Anybody want to know what satisfied means in the Hebrew? It means to drink to the field. It means enough. 
it means to be at peace. To drink to the feel enough to be at peace. There is a time and a season when he gives you pressed down and shaken together and running over. But there is a time when he says it's enough, just be satisfied. Yes, yes, yes. I have learned, therefore, whatever state I am in, to be content. Because guess what? Sometimes when I drink and I eat too much, it causes acid reflux. And that's not a good thing. But we all want overflow. All the time I want to be overflowing. All the time I got to have more than enough. And that makes you greedy. You got to understand there are seasons. There are seasons in your life when you have to say, I'm satisfied. I'm good. I'm at peace. Because when I'm always reaching for overflow, sometimes my peace escapes me. Is that good? All right. And it shall come to pass afterwards. Somebody said afterward. Amen. It shall come to pass afterward. After what? After you learn how to be satisfied and after you learn how to remove, to allow God to remove the shame. That's when the rest of this is going to come to pass. Because it said it shall come to pass afterward. You've got to learn how to be satisfied before anything else can come to pass. He's not going to put anything else. He's not going to bless you anymore until you can be satisfied where you are. Okay? You know what? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not completely where I want to be. I'm not completely, totally free from this urge of the things that I want to do. But you know what? I made it through the day. I'm satisfied. Thank you, Lord. I got through today. Tomorrow's another day. We'll fight another devil tomorrow. But today, I made it through today. I'm satisfied with that. Thank you, Lord. All right? I don't have an overflow in my bank account. But you know what? They didn't turn my lights off today. That's a good day. I know what it feels like to have your lights turned off. All right? They didn't turn my lights off. It's a good day. All right? You cannot walk in the anointing that God has for you when you live with shame and you don't know how to be satisfied. Because what you would do is you would use up the anointing and what you would, what you would take is, is when there is anoint, an anointing on us, we would see it as insignificant because we don't think it's strong enough. Because I'm comparing my anointing to somebody else's who's overflowing right now. When sometimes the anointing that is on me is not hollering and screaming and no people are not falling out in the spirit and people are not being healed, but there's still an anointing on me. But if I can't be satisfied with that anointing, that means that I'm calling that anointing insignificant. And nowhere in your walk with God is insignificant. Okay? You may not be calling down fire from heaven today, but wait till tomorrow. Let somebody else call down fire from heaven today. That's all right. Just get, on, just get under their fire. Just, don't, let it get, don't let it set your head on fire, but I mean, you know. <laughs> Your past is over. What you've got to do is the Bible says you've got to reach forward to the prize of the high calling. And while you're reaching forward, God can reach back. Okay? Is that good? Yes. All right. If it gave you everything you wanted when you wanted, what would you reach for? Does that make sense? All right. Hmm. The fact is that some things that we lost, we needed to lose, right? But some things that we lost, I want it back. I, I want it. I want it back. Anybody want some things back? All right, we're gonna figure. We're gonna figure out. We're gonna figure out something this morning. I'm gonna show y'all something. All right. He said, "I will pour out my spirit." Who I like that pour out my spirit. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall see dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And upon the servants and upon the handmaids in all those days, I'm going to pour out my spirit. Can I tell you a secret? That day you waited for is here. This is the day he wants to pour out his spirit. This is the day we're supposed to see dreams. This is the day we're supposed to have visions. This is the day we're supposed to prophesy. This is the day our children are supposed to come to the Lord. This is the day. This is the day. But are we seeing the move of God that is happening today, are we negating it and calling it insignificant because it's not what we had in mind? Hmm. We miss so many things because it's not what we had in mind. God said, what I'm doing is, you are looking for a pouring out of emotion. Hmm. 
But God said, what you don't understand is, I said in my word, I will pour out my spirit. In other words, he said, I'm going to pour out me. I, he said, I'm going to pour out. God is pouring out himself. Can I tell you what happens when God pours out himself? It changes you. So the revival that's about to hit this land is not necessarily a revival where we're running from church to church to church and we're all, you know, flying the flags. I don't have nothing wrong with flags. Just don't hit me when you go by me and don't mess up my hair if you don't mind. I don't have anything. And I love the shofar. Everybody knows that I do. I preached on it and I love Israel better than anything else. Y'all know that I do. I've been there several times. I want to go back. I preach there and I, I, I love Israel. I'm not against all that. I'm not against all the hella, hella, hallelujah. But can I tell you something? If you ain't changed, I don't want to hear your hallelujah. Because the spirit that is about to be pouring out God said, I'm going to pour out myself and I'm going to change some mindsets and I'm going to change some people and I'm going to change some directions and I'm going to change some futures. Can I tell you, we got enough preachers. Why can't we get somebody to just walk it? We got enough preachers. Everybody wants to be a preacher. He's not pouring out preachers. He said, I need some people that can be some doctors and stand for God. I need some people that can be some lawyers and stand for God. That's important. I need some school teachers that can stand for God. I need some mamas and some daddies that will stay together and stand for God and raise your children. I need some mamas that are all by yourself, but you're still going to stand for God and raise your babies. I need somebody that will stand for God in the White House. It's not about your color. It's not about whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. It's not about if you got good hair or not. It's not about that. Can you stand for God in the White House? My God. Because our country is in a deficit. We got bad credit. We got a bad name. So when we sow into our country, we're sowing into bad soil. Hmm. But if we could get somebody in the White House that would stand for God. Come what may, though all hell is hell, I'm going to call marriage marriage. I'm going to call babies babies. I ain't worried about whether you go and play Planned Parenthood. I ain't even going to talk about that. I'm not going to mix words with it. I Can I tell you, when we get somebody that says, I'm going to stand for the Word of God, then can I tell you, we're going to be able to see the country turn around and then we can sow into good soil. And we can reap a harvest. Yes. My Lord have mercy. Yes, yes. I didn't mean to go there, but I did. The Spirit of God. Can I tell you, I'm going to say this right, right quick because God's got it in my spirit, so I'm going to say it. If you're not registered to vote, you need to be. You need to be. It's important. We are living in important times right now, and our vote is significant. Your vote matters. You may say, well, I'm just one person. Honey, you one person, but you got 10,000 angels backing you up. If you'll go in there and, you'll, and you will vote the mind of Christ, and you will pray before you go fast. Some things come out but by prayer and fasting. You need to fast about what you're going to vote. You need to know who we're putting in the White House. God can turn this thing around. Huh. It's important, I'm just saying. The Spirit of God awakened me at 5 o'clock on Friday morning and He began to talk to me in my spirit. And He told me to talk to you about the significance of the insignificant. Now I want you to turn real quick to Matthew 21 because today is Palm Sunday. So I want to talk about it. Y'all alright? Y'all bored yet? Alright, as long as you're not bored. I don't see anybody falling asleep. So, and I ate some crackers before. If y'all need something to eat, there's some stuff back there in the kitchen. <laughs> Matthew 21. Now, I can tell you where that is. It's the first book in the New Testament. Yeah. <sighs> it's the first book in the Greek Testament. Matthew 21. And 1, I believe, is where we're going to start. And when they drew nigh to Jerusalem and were come to Bethage unto the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and he said unto them, I want you to go into the village over, village over against you. In other words, I want you to go to that village over yonder. That's the way we'd say it, Note Park. 
because I'm fixing to do something. That's what we'd say in Oak Park 2. I go to that village over yonder, and straightway, he said, you're going to find an ass tied up, and there's going to be a colt with her. I want you to loose them. That I broke off tape. I want you to loose them, and I want you to bring them to me. Don't you just love it that Jesus is mindful of an insignificant ass? Yes. If he can loose an ass, he can loose you. I'm just saying. <laughs> Sorry, Pastor. I'm going to preach this way so I can't see the pastor looking at me. Whew. So sorry. Y'all, this is the week before Jesus is going to the cross. He got a lot on his mind. I mean, that's, that's a lot to have on your mind, okay? You're fixing to go to the cross, and you know you can't escape it. And not only are you going to the cross, but the sin of the whole world is riding on you. Yes. That's a lot of responsibility. That's got to bother you. And in the middle of all of that that he has on his mind, he is still commanding and saying, go here and go there and do this and do that. Because his mind is not on himself, his mind is on you. And he said, oh, by the way, in the middle of all that, boys, there's an ass sitting over yonder, go get her, I need her. Mm -hmm. That's what he said about you. And anyway, <laughs> and if any man says anything to you, tell him the Lord has need of them. And straightway, uh -huh, the Lord even needs an ass. <laughs> they tell me all the time, because they, they tell me women can't preach. Y'all ever heard that? Yeah. Women are not supposed to preach. But y'all, if he can speak through a jackass, he can certainly speak through a woman. I mean, come on. <laughs> so I'm not preaching this morning just in case y'all wonder because I'm not supposed to. <sighs> just went right out from under that one, didn't I? If anybody says anything to you, what I want you to do is I want you to tell them that the Lord has need of them. And straightway when you tell them that, the Lord, he said, then they're going to send them with you. And he said, all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, meek and sitting upon an ass. And the court, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and they did exactly what Jesus commanded them to do. And they brought the ass and the colt and they put their clothes on them and they set Jesus thereon. And there was a great multitude that spread their garments in the road. And others cut down branches of the trees and they strode them in the road. Does anybody realize that there is a significance to your life? Do you realize that every little thing has played a vital role in your story, even the asses. Mm -hmm. Nothing has escaped the attention of God. He is a God of detail. He is very detailed, okay? He created the earth in great detail. As a matter of fact, you know what he did? He measured the firmament by the span of his hand. From here to here, he measured the firmament. And he said, yep, that's about big enough right there. Because he's a God of detail. He didn't just leave it to chance. He is a God of detail. Not only did he do that, but after he measured the firmament, he knew exactly how many stars that he needed to start playing Frisbee. And he just started slinging them up into the firmament. Matter of fact, he even calls the stars by name. He knows when one falls from the sky. He knows exactly what he's doing because he is a God of detail. He commanded the sun. He said, I need you to shine. He said, and as a matter of fact, he said, as you go down, I'm going to need a lesser light. And he said, I'm going to use the moon because he is a God of detail. He doesn't leave anything to chance and he doesn't let anybody else make a decision for him because he knew that it was going to take the sun and the moon to cause us to be able to stay in balance because he's a God of detail and he knows what he's doing and then what he did was he said we need some water and he just scooped up the seas with his hand. I'm talking about just reached down and scooped it up and then he said you know what I like mountains. So he just reached down there because he's a God of detail. And every single mountain that is on the face of this earth, he just started pinching them. You know how your mama used to pinch you? I'm talking about with the force of a vice grip. That's not good. But you shut up. Tear your ear off is what I'm screaming. 
My mama could throw something and it was like a boomerang. It'd come back to her, let her do it again. Amen. And she had a really good aim too. That's what I'm screaming. Jesus, God Almighty, He just reached down and He pitched the land. And He just pulled up the mountains. Because He knew where the mountains need to be to balance off the land. So that everything was in balance because He's a God of detail. Matter of fact, He spoke to the sea that He had scooped out with His hand. And out of the sea, He made fish. He didn't make this, the fish out of the air. He made it out of the sea. He spoke to the firmament and he, and he called out of the firmament. He called the birds. See, he calls out of everything that, that, is, it is, that it needs to operate in. That's what he bursts it out of. Can I tell you something? Everything that you need to be birthed out, everything that you need to operate in, God already has it in you. He's calling it out of you. He's not, he don't need to put anything else in you. He's already got it all in you because he's a God of detail. He created you with everything that you needed to be able to operate in the environment that he wants you to operate in. Hey! It's a good word right there is what I'm talking about. My Lord, have mercy. Because God is a God of great detail. He created heaven in, de in great detail. Matter of fact, he said it like this. He said, the heaven is created in such great detail. He said, I made it my throne. The earth is my footstool, but the heaven, he said, it is my throne. Why? Because God is preeminent. Eminent is, is talking about, it refers to kings. Okay? A king is an eminent one. But God said, I needed a throne before you was ever a king because I'm preeminent. I was a king before you was a king. I'm pre-king. So I just want you to know I went ahead and created me a throne before you ever had your little throne because God is a God of great detail. Matter of fact, they tell me that there's a city called the New Jerusalem and it's created with such great detail that we already know the size of it. We already know where it's coming from. God said one day, he said, that new city, he said, it's going to come down from the sky. He said, I created in great detail. And I believe with all of my heart that the new Jerusalem is going to do just what he said it was going to do. It's going to come down because he's a God of great detail. Lord, have mercy. And guess what? You were created in that exact same detail. Can I tell you how I know? Can I tell you why I know you're great? I told you. He spoke to the air and created the birds because that's what they needed to operate in. That's what they needed to survive. He spoke, my, my church is ahead of me. He spoke because they know me. He spoke to the sea and he pulled out of it the fish because the sea needed the fish to be able to survive and be sustained. And I know that you're great because he spoke to himself and he called you out of himself because you need him to be able to survive and to be able to function and to be able to be to be sustained. Hey, it's hot in here. Lord, have mercy. Lord, it's good stuff, I tell you. Don't you just love him? How can you not love him? Y'all don't get excited when y'all see this stuff. Lord, have mercy. You think it takes me a long time to preach it? You ought to see me trying to get it. My Lord, have mercy. So our text that we read today is no different. Mm -hmm. Jesus said there's an ass over yonder on 3rd Street. He said, I need y'all to go over yonder. And as a matter of fact, he is such a God of detail. He said, what I need you to do is, he said, I need you to go over there to 3rd Street and I need you to get him. He said, but you know what? He said, there ain't nobody ever sat on this joker. Nobody. Because he's a God of detail. Nobody's ever even sat on him. Can you imagine how many times somebody wanted to ride that ass? And they couldn't. Because God had already spoken it. That's right. He created it for his purpose. And somebody came along and said, man, I, I, I'll give you good money for that ass right there. And the farmer said, I don't know why, but I can't sell that one. <laughs> Yo, nobody had ever ridden him, but he was tied up. You don't, I live in the country. You don't tie donkeys up. You let them get out there in the field and they do what they want to do, all right? But this donkey was tied up already. And I'm talking about it was tied up on a specific day at a certain time on a specific house. God is a God of detail. He is a God of detail, can I tell you. Lord, have mercy. 
Anybody ever notice last night I talked to you about purpose? Do you hear me today talking to you about God's purpose? Because you can't know your purpose if you don't know His purpose. Alright, we got to know His purpose. We talk about Jonah. We all like to preach about Jonah. But what about the insignificance of the whale? We don't preach on the whale. Do you know what God had to do to make that whale be by that boat during that storm at that moment at that time so that when Jonah got thrown off of that boat in that season at that time then all of a sudden that whale who was on the other side of the sea who somebody tried to catch because that was a lot of meat that whale was by that boat to catch that man can I tell you why God was so specific can I tell you why because there was that city called not Nineveh that needed to see that Jesus and Jonah had that Jesus in him and though Jonah didn't want to do what God said do God said don't worry about it I got an ass tied up for you and you might be being an ass about it but I'm about to fix you buddy hey I'm sorry I don't mean to be cussing my lord because we don't think about the insignificant things. But see, the insignificance is all about one thing. And it's about the significance of your purpose. When you get into the significance of your purpose, which is so somebody can see Jesus, then God will take care of the insignificant things. Y'all remember that little bitty short dude named Zacchaeus? We talk about him. Boy, I'm coming to your house today. We talk about old Zacchaeus. But what about that tree? Can you imagine how many times the DOT tried to cut that tree down? There was a road going through there. There was obviously a road going through there because Jesus was walking on the road. They had to, you know how you go on the mountain and you wonder why can't we make this straight? They wanted to make that road straight, but there was a tree standing there, a sycamore tree. It was insignificant to anybody but God's purpose because God knew that on that day, at that time, in that season, in that time, God knew that Zacchaeus was going to be standing there and there was a man called Jesus going to be passing by and Zacchaeus was going to want to see Jesus and God guarded and sent angels to guard that insignificant sycamore tree. <laughs> Hey! Hey! What has God been guarding for you? Yeah. Somebody else might have tried to tear it down. But God's been guarding it for you. Because He wanted you to see Jesus. It's all about Jesus, is what I'm saying. Look back at your mess. Nothing. Not one second. Not one second has been left to chance. Not one second. Not the ass you dated. <laughs> Not the ass you married. <laughs> Not the ones that lied to you and lied on you. None of it was left to chance. Yeah, people ask me all the time, well, if God is such a loving God, why did you get married to that man? <laughs> and for eight years, yeah, and for eight years you were abused. Couldn't have children. Why did he allow that? He allows the asses in our life for a reason, for a purpose. I couldn't have seen Jesus the way I see Jesus now had it not been for that ass. <laughs> okay? Y'all good with that? Watch this. Everything was a part of the plan because everything would become the ass that you would ride on to your destiny. I'm just saying. But here's what we got to remember. God does use the asses to get us to a point. Okay? But he told Abraham, sanctuary, leave the asses behind. 
The ass could take him so far. But he got to a point where he was about to go to another elevation. And Abraham looked over there at his little boy. And he said, y'all and the asses are going to stay here. But me and the thing that I birthed, we're going to go yonder and we're going to worship. Because this ass has taken me as far as it can take me. I ain't tied to that ass anymore. I'm through with that one. It can't take me no further. In other words, loose me and let me go. Yeah. Yeah. Lord have mercy. They're just for transportation. That's all. Just for transportation. To get you to that day. To that spot. For that reason. That you might see Jesus. And the multitudes that went before. And that followed. Were crying. Hosanna. To the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet. Not the Lord. I wanted a king, but I just can't make myself call you nothing but a prophet. The prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. How many understand that God is a God of today, yesterday, and of tomorrow? And the very arrival of Jesus takes us literally on a journey of going backward in order to see how to go forward. Y'all okay? The arrival of the Messiah was first prophesied way back in the Garden of Eden. Way back there in the past. You can't discount the past because some of your greatest prophecies were given to you in your past. God was speaking into, you, into your future very loudly in your past. You go all the way, way, way back to the garden and the first prophecy came forth, comes forth about this Jesus who rode in on this ass. And the prophecy was the seed of the serpent will bruise the seed of the woman. But the seed of the woman will crush the seed of the serpent. That was a good prophecy right there. And that was a good shouting point right there. When you understand that in the beginning when sin entered, it was already prophesied, you old sneaky snake, that you can do whatever you want to. You might want to go ahead and bruise all you want to because after a while, I ain't going to bruise your head. But after a while, the seed of the woman is going to crush your head. He ain't here yet, but look for him because he's coming. Lord have mercy. So I can't fully appreciate the birth of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John until I go all the way back to Genesis. I got to understand. Why did he get here? Why is it so important? What is it so important about this man? The same is true with the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, okay? It was foretold in the very beginning. In fact, the entire Old Testament is a testament of Jesus the Messiah. If you read it and you look for Jesus, you'll find him in every single book. It's amazing, all right? It's no different with Palm Sunday, okay? Because this is the week before Jesus was crucified, all right? Now, here's the thing. I would think that given all these religious folk who stayed in the Torah, they stayed in the temple, they knew the Torah, and there's prophecy after prophecy after. I'm talking about verbatim. And I wanted to go over all of them with you this morning, but I knew I didn't have time. Verbatim of exactly how Christ was going to arise. It told them that he was going to come in on a donkey in, in Bethlehem. It told them that. And they completely missed it. It told them everything that he was going to do. It told them that he was going to come in on a donkey. And he was going to ride through Jerusalem. And they missed it. You'd think that when they, at least when they saw him saddle that ass and come in to Jerusalem, that they'd have said, this is him. But they missed it. Can I ask you something, church? 
are we going to miss the return? Jesus. How many people are coming to church? We're religious, but we're not looking for him. The scripture said he's going to return. The scripture gave us the signs of his return. But are we going to miss him when he comes back? Because that significant moment is going to be one you can't get back. That's a significant moment, all right, that you don't want to miss, all right? If nothing else, they should have at least recognized the asses as a sign. Can I tell you something? Sometimes it's not the things that went right in your life that is a sign that you're going to be great. Sometimes your asses are a sign. Mm-hmm. Y'all got it? Yes. Uh-huh. I see y'all. Y'all got it. I love it. If you can look back and you can look at the things that, you know, tied you up in your past, those things are what's going to be used to take you into your future, okay? Why? Because failure is an indication. An indication. There's something great in me. There's something great in me. If you've never failed, there's no greatness in you. Because you don't know how to appreciate it. When you fail a few times, you appreciate it when you do walk. All right? Ask, ask Sister Kathy, get your leg messed up where you can't walk. All of a sudden, walking becomes significant, what you used to take for granted. Okay? We need to, we need to look at the things that we take for granted. Okay? But they missed it. They completely missed it. All right? So, what caused them to miss Jesus? Well, I mean, what, what, how did they miss it, all right? Can I tell you why? They wanted a king, but he didn't appear as the king they had in mind because they were used to what they see. Because back in those days, when a king had won a battle, he would always come into the city because he wanted everybody to praise him and say, oh, king, look what you've done. Well, the king won, won, won the battle to start with. It was the army. You were sitting up there in the palace. But he would get them to saddle his white horse. And he would start riding it into the city. And what would happen is all the people would know that they had just won the battle. They know the king is coming, so they start preparing. And there would always be a, a mass of people before him that starts throwing things into the street as the king comes through. Well, they did that for Jesus. There would be a multitude that would follow him that would sing praises to the king. Oh, king, you have won the victory. Well, they did that. You know what they missed? You know why they didn't recognize it? Because he wasn't on a white horse. Because he was on an ass. Because they see you riding in on an ass, they think you're not great. Because they're looking for your white horse. But can I tell you something? Do not let the mode of your transportation sway you. Because good things come in on an ass. Yeah. That's good news right there. That's good news. I'm just trying to help you, all right? Mm, my Lord, have mercy. I understand that what we do is we expect to reach our destiny through these grandiose manners and all this stuff or miracles or the parting of the Red Sea or at least get, you know, speak out of heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. At least give me a voice out of heaven. But the truth of the matter is the dumb things that you ride on that carry you to your purpose. It's the dumb things I said that you ride on that carry you to your purpose. All right, don't discount the dumb things you've been riding on to carry you to your purpose, all right? Because when God has something for you, he already has a plan to get you there. And can I tell you something? If that plan falls, he has something in reserve waiting for another plan. Job said it like this. Job said, but God knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me, when I rode on all the asses, when I've been tied up and tangled up, I shall come.
come forth as gold. I shall come forth as gold. So instead of me focusing on the when all of these trials come to me, I choose to focus on the I shall come forth as gold. Don't you count me out because I'm going to shine one day. Don't you count me out because I'm going to wear a crown one day. Don't you count me out. I'm going to have some gold one day. He said I shall come forth. My Lord. Jesus have mercy. Your actions, no your act, reactions have caught God by surprise. He didn't look at you and say, whoops. I wasn't counting on that. Well, some of us, he probably did. But for the most part, he didn't look at you and say, whoops, I wasn't counting on that, all right? Because beside him, there is no other. He knows all things. But here's the thing. Hmm. How many understand that in the book of John, there's another account of Jesus coming in and the triumphant en entry? And in that, it talks about what happened before. Before Jesus entered in on Palm Sunday, you know what had just happened? He had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And there was a buzz in the city, not about Jesus, but about the thing he raised from the dead. Sometimes God will let some things die in your life that are close to you and get you to a point where you're able to speak to that thing and raise it up so that people can start talking about the resurrection of your dead things. So it's all right to let some things die because God's going to give you the power to raise it back up again. So all the city and everybody in the community and everybody in the neighborhood starts talking not about you, but starts talking about the dead things in your life that God has raised back up again and caused them to live. My Lord, he had to reach back to do that, y'all. He had to reach back to be able to bring Lazarus back up from the dead, did he not? But can I tell you something? God's story is not noticed by the things that are living in your life. Sometimes God's glory is noticed by the things that are dead. Because you can't have the glory of God without a resurrection. You couldn't have Jesus without the resurrection, all right? So don't discount the, the, the bad things, the dead things in your life, all right? Have you ever thought about Jesus raised Lazarus just before the Passover? It was going to be only a few days and that he was going to go to the cross. He, raised, he saved Lazarus and couldn't save himself. Mm -hmm. He raised Lazarus from the dead and he was going to the, to the tomb himself. And he knew it. It wasn't that he couldn't save himself. He could. He said, nobody takes my life. He said, I, I lay it down myself, all right? So why was Jesus so intent on dying? Can I tell you why? Because he could not go forward until he went backward, all right? I'm about to close this thing up. Y'all good? Give me just a few minutes. I'm about to tell you something, all right? What I want to do is I want you to understand that he's been working his way back to you, babe, with a burning love inside. He's been working his way back to you. All right? Can I tell you how? Y'all remember Adam and Eve? Dirty old mules. Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, right? Everybody was at peace. The garden was at peace. They had a peaceful home, all right? But Satan was looking for a way to disrupt the flow because he didn't like it. Am I right? All right, so watch this. Y'all hear me because you got to stay with me. you got to get cerebral. My church has heard this, but God said for me to do it, so that's what I'm going to do. All right, watch this. Satan wanted to mess up the flow because he saw that God loved man and hated sin. He knew that. you got to stay with me, all right? So Satan began to think about that thing. And he said, what will happen... If I take what God hates and put it in what he loves. Mm -hmm. The truth about sin is this. God wasn't worried about the acts of sin that they committed. He was concerned about the nature of sin that got in them. Hear me? 
All right? So here's the conflict. For God to love man now, because now sin is in him, for God to love man, he's going to have to love what's in him. And he can't love sin. Because he hates sin. So if God loved what he hated, then he'd be a liar. And God is a man that he, should, that he cannot lie. Y'all follow me? But if God hated man because of the sin that was in him, then he's going to have to hate what he created. That would mean he would hate his own image. Y'all hear me? All right. So because Adam and Eve ate of the seemingly insignificant fruit, God and man are now eternally enemies. Can I tell you when an insignificant thing has eternal effects, it becomes significant to God. And he starts working away to fix it. Okay? So God's in a dilemma. He said, all right. He said, how do I save who I love and destroy what I hate? How am I going to do this? Remember I told you, God told Adam, the day that you very, the, the day that you eat of the fruit, you're going to die. Isn't that what he said? The day you eat of the fruit, you're going to die. So now God's faced with his own word. They ate it. I got to kill them. I got to. Because he's not a liar. He is bound by his word. You need to understand that's why you need to know his word. Because he's bound by his word. So if you ever get his word, he's bound by it. He's got to do it because it's his word. He's bound by his word, all right? So here's the answer to the significance of it all. What God did was, it's not about the fruit. It's about the root of what got in us, right? It's not even about the fruit of sin. It's about the root of sin. So here's what God did. God called the root that he loved to forever destroy the root that he hated and Jesus by Jesus peace was made through the blood of his cross to reconcile reckon all things unto himself it says in there weep not behold the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has prevailed to open the book and to loose somebody got about to get their ass loose and to loose the seven cells there can't nobody loose you like he can loose you I'm just trying to tell you so what happened was God stepped back into time so that he could call on a root that he already loved and it's the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the world he was already slain so that you might be saved and he reached back into time so that he could get that slain lamb and he said now I know what I can do about this root of sin that's in you now I know what I can do I don't have to destroy the man I can destroy the sin and Jesus had to ride in on the donkey and he had to die on the cross and he had to go in the grave and he had to get up at that time and he had to be raised and I'm okay Stand to your feet if you will, please, Brother Stan. Oh! He had to. Oh, that barred tomb didn't seem very significant. No man had ever laid in it. No telling how many people they wanted to throw in it. Yes. But see, the lamb was already slain. That's right. <laughs> before the foundations of the world. Before sin ever entered. Yes. So God said, guess what? I can restore time. Yes. He said, I'm going to reach back. Yes. And all the way back there, he started reaching back. And when he got the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, he got you because you were created before the foundation of the world in his image and in his likeness. And he's just turning you into what you were. Yes, yes. Glory. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Y'all hear me? Thanks, I y'all. I don't know why we're so worried about sin. 
taken care of way back yonder. It's an insignificant thing. In light of the significance of your purpose. In light of the significance of the slain lamb. Before the foundations of the world. He didn't have to. But God looked all over heaven. Searching. He said, I've got to find somebody worthy. He looked at all the angels that he created. He searched. He searched because he had created man in his image. And he had sworn to love this man always. And because God could not swear by anything greater, he swore by himself. So there was no one, no one worthy but the one that he had unbosomed from himself. Just like he reached in him and took out you, he reached in him and took out the lamb. He said, there's not another one worthy. You can't pay for your sin. You can't. You're not worthy. But he reached in himself. He unbosomed himself. And he took a look at his son. He dared not say a thing because that was his son. He walked away. But Jesus followed him. Jesus saw the tears streaming down his daddy's face. No doubt he wondered, why does he love this man so much? But then Jesus peeped over and he looked in the garden and he saw his daddy's image. He said, oh, that's why he loves them so. Because they're created in his image. Jesus said, wow. My brother and sister looks a lot like me. He said, Daddy, I'll do it. I'll do it, Daddy. God said, go away, boy. He said, I don't want to hear that. Uh-uh. No. Jesus said, it's the only way, Daddy, for us to redeem your image. Daddy, you got a reputation to uphold. When you made them, you promised to keep them. When you created them, you promised. And you're not a man that you should lie. We got to do this. Can you imagine the heart of the Father? He had to watch his son who had already been slain before the foundations of the world. You know what I love? Every day during that time, the priest would go into the temple and they would bring the blood of the lamb and they would place it on the altar to take care of the sin of the people. And all of heaven said silently, because they were appeased, but nothing had been reckoned. Every day, over and over and over, the same sacrifice. But they took Jesus, and they hung him on the cross, and his blood began to fall to the ground. He went to the tomb. Dealt with sin, death, hell, and the grave and sin. He overcame. He overcame. Now he didn't ride into town on a grandiose way, but that mode of transportation was plenty enough. He overcame your sin. And then he came back. The Bible said that he was seen for 40 days and nights. He even brought the saints back with him. But then something happened. He didn't just die and go to hell and overcome your sin. 
because that wouldn't have been enough because I told you that God is a God of detail he created heaven can I tell you what heaven looks like it is the temple of the Lord when you see the temple you see a picture of heaven the temple that we that we study today is a perfect replica of heaven there's a temple in heaven but in that temple in heaven there is also an altar God is standing there his son has been slain and the blood has fallen but he's still not satisfied because he's a God of detail so 40 days later the Bible said that Jesus ascended he ascended he ascended into the heavens all of heaven is sitting silent Jesus ascended into heaven the slain lamb he walked in the back temple door dressed in regal apparel he walked in he walked to the brazen altar and he stood there and he sprinkled his blood on the altar and when he did all of heaven stood to their feet and Jesus had already said it's finished on the cross but my God and your God let out a roar like we never heard before and he said I'm satisfied I'm satisfied it is satisfied it is finished oh. he said that's the significance y'all thought he was insignificant but God said I called him significant because it appeased you God it loosed you bow your heads please the spirit of the Lord is moving the spirit of the Lord is moving this morning I'm not going to throw dust on anybody or do anything stupid but I do want if God is touching you right now I want to ask first does anybody not know Jesus are you not saved are you not sure that if he comes you won't miss him because that's the most important part you want to know you don't miss him if you're sure that you have received him as your Lord and your Savior. Not just as your religious preference, but as your Lord and as your Savior. If you're sure of that, and you say, you know what? I need some things redeemed. I need some things that I missed the moment. I didn't and I noticed that it was significant at the moment, but I, I, I see it now. If that's you, I want you to come forward. I just want you to come forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. God loves it when we bow at his altar. Oh, God, I see you. 
God, I see you. I see you moving. I see you moving. I see you reaching back, God. Reaching back and redeeming time. Redeeming the lost places. I see you redeeming. I see you healing, God. You're healing our broken lives. Healing our broken hearts. Healing our sin. Healing our thoughts. Healing, God. Healing our bodies, Father. I see you, God, fixing and mending marriages. Fixing and mending relationships. Fixing and mending ministries, God. I see you, Father. I see it. I see it in the spirit, God. You're calling forth your sons and your daughters. They will dream dreams and see visions, God. You are calling forth a mighty army this morning, God. Let us walk in you. Let us breathe in you. Let us move in you and have our being in you, God. God, I bless you, Lord. I thank you that you are the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. I thank you that you are the Lion of the tribe of Judah. I bless you, Father, that it is finished, it is finished, it is finished. I thank you, God, that you cause us to be a part of the family of God. You deserve the glory.
to the temple, went straight to the temple. And he sprinkled the blood and all of heaven stood and cheered. But that wasn't all. Because he knew that on this day, at this time, in this city, at this church, he knew that there was going to be a this people. <laughs> Society might call us misfits, but I think I call us fit. Fit for the kingdom. So what he did was, because he knew that, he said, I'll not leave you comfortless. John's got to have some tests Friday. I want everybody to stretch your hand toward John. And uh, who will mind that he's been bleeding. And we're going to just believe right now. Y'all want you to stretch your hands toward this man of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to stop, even right now, stop this bleeding, Father, by the power of the living God. Lord, we, we're believing the report of the Lord, Father. We ask right now with the doctors look that this bleeding will be stopped in the name of Jesus by the power of the living God. We lose healing of this body. By your stripes we are healed. We come together as the body, Father, as the body of Christ. And we believe right now that John is healed. Lord, let the pain subside. Let the pain be gone. In the name of Jesus, by the power of the living God. Lord, we thank you right now. We praise you right now for a good report. We believe the report of the Lord in the name of Jesus. Come on, church. Let's give God some praise. Wow. Praise God. Wow, what a word today. I tell y'all, y'all should have been, man, you got a word today, church. Let me tell you, that's a word. And, and men, home with a heart, God bless you so much. A lot of us have been exactly where you've been. This church is made up. This boy was a drug addict, and I was on alcohol for many years, and God delivered me and set me free. That's what we have in this church. So we just, we know God is able. God can do it, church. He's able. He'll do it for you. He'll do it for all of us. We're going to have a dismissal prayer. And, and men, we're not going to meet this Sunday. We're going to wait till next Sunday. There's so much going on today, okay? Next Sunday, the men that are going on the retreat, we're going to have a meeting, okay? After church. After church next Sunday. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your grace, your awesome power. 
We thank you for the word that was went forth here today. Lord, I ask that you would bless Sherry and, and, and Dwayne, Father, and the entire group that is with them from the sanctuary. Father, bless them, lead them, and guide them every step. Let it be ordered of you. Father, we thank you for this woman of God, how you used her today by the spirit of the living God, the word that has went forth. Father, it's fallen on good ground, springing forth, and we give you the praise. We give you the glory. We give you all the honor. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hug somebody. Tell me, show well good today.